is Deepak Premkumar. I'm a junior here at Iowa State studying global resource systems and economics. And as a member of the World Affairs Series, I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of our sponsors tonight, the University Committee on Lectures, the Government of the Student Body, and the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Um, as someone that's looking forward to a career in development, um, I'm really pleased and excited to hear our speakers tonight. Um, and I've, we have both Dr. Shah and um, the director of the Peace Corps, um, Hessler Radelet, here tonight. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to explain how we are doing questions. Um, so uh, we are having throughout this um, lecture, at the end of the lecture, you are provided with index cards. And um, at the end of the lecture, we'd like you to write down your questions and then raise your hands. That way, um, we will be collecting those index cards. And our moderator, uh, Manjit Mizra, from the Seed Science um, Center will be able to pick them up. Um, also, I would like to introduce um, a lecture we're having later this um, next week with Robin Wright, who's a journalist and a political analyst. And she has studied about the rage and rebellion across the Islam Islamic world, and it's on November 1st in the Great Hall. And then tonight we have the opportunity to um, hear from Thomas Goldstein, who is a, um, he's the author of the SCOTUS blog, and he's a publisher, and he's also been an attorney in many Supreme Court cases. So we have many great speakers, and it is now my pleasure to welcome Dean Winterstein. I have to tell you that the best part of my job is getting to work with students and uh, Deepak is an example of the wonderful students that we have here at Iowa State University. Well welcome again to this keynote address of the World Affairs Series. Uh, today's topic, Feeding the Future, Food Security and Agriculture in Development, commands the attention and efforts of many world leaders, agricultural scientists, and people committed to agricultural development. Through our work in the Center for Sustainable Rural Livelihoods, we've seen how powerful agriculture is in combating poverty. We've seen how collaborative approaches that support and educate rural families in the developing world can translate into access to sufficient food, improved nutrition, and sustainable incomes, and the good health and well-being that follows. Today you'll hear from two national leaders on the United States government's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative. Before I introduce them, I have one quick announcement, and that is, after the presentations end, there will be a break followed by a Peace Corps event in this room called Inspiring the Next Generation of Volunteers. Please consider staying to learn more about the opportunities that they have for you in the Peace Corps. Now let me introduce our speakers. Dr. Rajiv Shah is Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. He leads the efforts of more than 8,000 professionals in 80 missions around the world and spearheads the Feed the Future Food Security Initiative. Dr. Shah previously served as the USDA Undersecretary for Research, Education and Economics and Chief Scientist. He also serves seven years in leadership positions in agricultural development in the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation. Dr. Shaw earned his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania Medical School and his master's in health economics from the Wharton School of Business. He attended the London School of Economics and is a graduate of the University of Michigan. Next, I would like to introduce Carrie hessler Radelet. Our second speaker, she is the Acting Director of the Peace Corps. She has also served the Peace Corps as Deputy Director and as volunteer with her husband in Western Samoa in the early 1980s. She has also been Vice President and Director of the Washington DC Office of the John Snow Incorporated, a global public health organization. She oversaw the management of public health programs in over 85 countries. Her public health work has focused on HIV, AIDS, and maternal and child health. Ms. Hesler Radlett earned her bachelor's degree from Boston University and her master's in health policy and management from the Harvard School of Public Health. 
Thank you both for taking the time from I know what are incredibly busy schedules to be with us today. Uh, even though you're competing with the boss, <laughs> we think we're in the right room this afternoon. So please help me welcome this afternoon's speakers and we'll begin with Dr. Shaw. Thank you and good afternoon. I, uh, it is nice to be here and I uh, want to thank you for being here. I thought if we mentioned that Bruce Springsteen was performing down the hall we might lose a big chunk of our folks here including me and so I uh, thought I'd keep that quiet. But uh, I want to thank Dean Winterstein, someone whom uh, our current agriculture secretary and our whole administration has a great deal of admiration for and respect for. Uh, and, and I'm glad, so glad to be here with the director of the Peace Corps. Carrie is, uh, is a colleague and a very talented leader and, and taking this on at a very important time. Uh, I, you know, I, I'd like to keep my remarks perhaps a little bit brief and informal. We have a, a report that we released just a couple hours ago over at the World Food Prize in Des Moines, which is the first Feed the Future progress report. And I'll speak to that a little bit later, but I also hope you'll get copies on your way out because it shows that the work we do in development and agriculture and health can have huge results and impact at tremendous scale and that that can happen actually quite quickly if we do things uh, with an absolute focus on delivering those types of outcomes. Is the, are the, do the slides project or am I supposed to do something with that? Um, this is, a, uh, this is a photo, of course, of uh, your own students, part of your effort. Oh, there we go. Uh, it, this, this is a, a picture of Iowa State University students that are participating in the science with practice theme, which is one that, as a great agricultural university and as we try to bring science into practice for the purpose of ending extreme poverty around the world, uh, we really do admire and recognize as a unique characteristic of this institution. Um, in particular, uh, we know that Iowa State houses some of the world's finest genomic-based agricultural breeding programs, is linked to one of the best known and best, uh, most effective extension systems in the country. Uh, and in those regards, people around the world look to this institution and those of you here, researchers, experts, extension officials, students, for help, for a vision as to what they can achieve in their own communities to end poverty, to end hunger, to improve nutrition for children. Your home, of course, to the Seed Science Center where you perform tests on as many as 40,000 seed samples annually and continue to, pr to do project work on seed policy and regulation in more than 30 countries today. And I just want to applaud and recognize that that is exactly the kind of effort that we at USAID ought to be connecting to and supporting. And that's why we're proud of the very, very significant partnerships we have here already. Partnerships that help advance biosafety and seed development. Partnerships that help address the impact of climate change on food and hunger. Partnerships that help us collectively measure uh, malnutrition in countries all around the world. This is a photograph, of course, of a simple uh, arm circumference measurement. And it's a reminder that while we recognize that sometimes times are tough here at home, uh, around the world, when we're talking of issues of hunger and malnutrition, we're talking about really basic levels of deprivation. 870 million children will go to bed, people will go to bed hungry tonight. Hundreds of millions of children will suffer from, do suffer from chronic malnutrition, which I come from a uh, Indian American family, as you can tell. My grandmother is about four feet, some odd inches tall on the low end of that. And we always thought it was a humorous thing that uh, so many people in my cultural group uh, immigrated to this country. I was born here in Ann Arbor. Uh, and the, the kids were always so much taller successively over generations. That it used to be a source of humor in, in our own family, uh, along with dreams of my own children becoming basketball players. But 
<clears throat> but now we know, actually, the science and the data is unbelievably clear that, that stunting chronic malnutrition leads to a lifelong inability to learn at a high level. It leads to 2 3% economic GDP loss in country after country where it's prevalent, and it hold back, holds back hundreds of millions of kids from achieving and aspiring to achieve their potential. So we said, well, what can we do about this? What can, can we actually tackle hunger and poverty at great scale? This is a photograph of Dr. Jill Biden, whom I had the chance to uh, visit. The two of us went together to Africa, in particular during last, uh, last fall, during the terrible, terrible drought in the Horn of Africa. Now, we know that we've had drought, a drought in the United States uh, just recently. And we know the consequences of that have been uh, extraordinary, including touching on communities here and very close to here. But we also know that we have modern agricultural systems that can help cushion the risks that are borne by communities that suffer from those droughts. In sub-Saharan Africa, those don't exist to that great extent. And as a result, when the Horn of Africa experienced the worst drought in six decades, 13.3 million people experienced acute hunger and malnutrition. 13.3 million people in that area. We had the chance to visit a refugee camp where kids and mothers were coming out of Somalia where there was an actual famine, which is, uh, as you know, not a condition of food availability, but actually a statistical determination of how many children under the age of five starve to death per day. And when that hits a certain level, it's called a famine. And we met these families in the morning, and we were just emotionally overwhelmed by seeing children on the verge of death because of simple lack of access to food. But then in the afternoon, we visited the Kenyan Agricultural Research Institute, and we saw the transformation that was taking place just 40, 50 kilometers away from that camp. At this institute, they've developed improved hybrid maize varieties that have led to a tripling of yields and productivity throughout western Kenya. They imagine that the, the work they've done in getting those varieties broadly introduced helped reduce the numbers of people who would have needed humanitarian assistance in Kenya by four million people during last year's tragic drought. So we know that it's possible, using science, using technology, focusing on agriculture, to create the conditions that can effectively eliminate widespread hunger and extreme deprivation for families and for children. And that's why President Obama in 2009 launched an effort that we call Feed the Future. Now, the President brought together uh, in 2009 the G20 countries and the G8 countries from all around the world and raised $22 billion to reinvest in fighting hunger through effective agricultural development and nutrition. And we committed that we would do things differently. We said we're going to uh, help countries develop plans and then follow those country plans. We said we were going to invest, reinvest in science, technology, relationships with great higher education institutions that can build partnerships and, and capacity all around the world. We said we'd take a business-like approach and measure our results and our outcomes. And today, in the first progress report we've issued, about two and a half years into the program's inception, I can tell you that because of the commitments the President made and because of the efforts we took, in 2011 we reached 1.8 million farm households around the world in 19 countries and helped them increase their yields and their incomes. We know that we reached 8.8 .8 million children and helped them fight chronic and acute malnutrition with targeted, effective food programs, feeding programs, and nutrition efforts. And we know that we helped dramatically increase productivity on 3.4 million hectares of land. The truth is, we're in the midst of the next green revolution. And it's a more modern green revolution. It is more adapted to the conditions and the climate challenges and the sustainability concepts that are appropriate for this time but it is going to be transformational. And this photograph you're looking at it was, it was a meeting that we were able to host in Washington, D.C. just a day before the president hosted the G8 leaders this past May at Camp David. 
And in his meeting, I was, uh, I was there for part of it and got to watch the rest on closed caption television, which was quite interesting. The world's uh, leaders of the largest economies in the world spent three hours in the morning talking about the European financial crisis. And then because President Obama insisted on it, they spent the next hour and a half discussing how we tackle food and hunger issues around the world and how we bring private investment together with technology and research and science to once and for all tackle this problem. We were able to announce in May that more than 60 companies had committed more than $4 billion to invest alongside the public donor commitments we were making in an effort that will measure and seek to move 50 million people out of poverty and hunger in six focused sub-Saharan African countries. And alongside and to enable that, each country committed to very specific policy reforms from letting women gain access to land tenure, to improving access to agricultural credit, to liberalizing the seed sector, to refusing to implement export bans, uh, and other misguided policy efforts that tend to make the problem worse over time. And that coming together of the public sector, the private sector, the scientific and technical experts around the world is what really gave us significant hope. Today at USAID, we're trying to bring that kind of an approach of science and technology applied to agriculture and applied to all of the challenges we tackle to everything we do. Uh, this is not just a story anymore about donors, the private sector, and developing countries. It's about students here, researchers here, and students all over this country getting more engaged. We're joined here by, uh, by Nat Manning, who is our Presidential Innovation Fellow. Uh, but I hope if you're a student, you'll get a chance to meet Nat afterwards, because he is a great example of someone who's a robotics entrepreneur, who's serving as USAID's very first Presidential Innovation Fellow and focusing on our Open Data Initiative. This past week, he and the Open Data team hosted a Hacking for Hunger event, which brought teams of volunteers, including many young people, together for 48 hours to build data-driven tools and applications that address food security. We're committed going forward to make sure every single point of data we have within our system is absolutely open for innovators and students and researchers to explore and create new insights and applications by playing with. And we think that's very, very, very exciting and important. The, the challenge for us in the future, and I really do believe this, is that so much of development policy and work has been driven by large institutions, institutions like USAID or the World Bank or the IMF. And to actually tackle the, the challenge of extreme poverty in the next few decades, the biggest breakthroughs are not likely to come from those institutions, but are likely to come from many of you. And so our commitment is to pursue a form of development we call open source development, where we make the problems apparent where we connect people to NGOs or civil society groups or governments or entrepreneurs in countries around the world, but where we also try to expand the number of problem solvers that are engaging on development and trying to solve these problems by tens of thousands of people because we know it's your creativity that will lead to mobile phone applications that help farmers and rural Nigeria ascertain market prices and negotiate with middlemen and improve their farm gate price and therefore their families' welfare and nutrition. We know that you will come up, as a group of students at Rice University did, with a, uh, a simple, very low cost device that helps babies breathe in the first 24 hours of life. It's an adapted suction device, which we deployed through one of our challenge grants quickly to Malawi, and on the very second day that they had tested their new idea in a clinic in Malawi, they saved a young baby's life. We know that those types of breakthroughs are possible, and we're increasingly focused very much on bringing that kind of innovation and technology to the task. So I'd like to conclude uh, with just a comment about how you might get involved. We have uh, set up a website called usaid.gov forward slash fall semester. And we'd love to ask you or your students to uh, log into the site, uh, to click on the site, and, and really find if you're interested in partnering with us. 
One way to do it is to, you can search for internships or volunteer opportunities or get connected to our implementing partners all around the world. Another option is in, this is one we're just piloting, so give us a chance and we'll see how it works. But if you're a student in particular and you're preparing a thesis paper or research paper and you'd like support and guidance from any one of our experts around the world, we have 8,000 people in more than 80 countries and they have a wealth of knowledge and expertise on, uh, on topics related to global development. We would like them to be able to help and assist you. It's my joke that I'm not quite sure that, I wasn't quite sure before I started visiting universities again to talk about the fall semester whether students actually wrote term papers anymore or just downloaded everything off Wikipedia. Because if I were in school, I might do the Wikipedia route. Uh, but to the extent you're doing original research, we have people who would love to help you and, and be connected and work with you. And uh, just as important, we're going to put up their development challenges and challenge grant programs so that if you have great new ideas, you're able to partner and participate and send them in and maybe we can fund a student group to go test it out as we did with the team from Rice that went to Malawi and on their second day out there saved a, a young baby's life. So I just uh, I want to thank you for having me here. I want to let you know that your government is completely committed to following a course in development that is about results, about innovation, about demanding more of others and delivering more for ourselves in that context. This new approach is absolutely working. We can there's, the proof is in the Feed the Future progress report. And uh, just as important, you know, we're not just opening this up to everyone across uh, university communities. We're also trying to reach local entrepreneurs and scientists and change agents in country after country after country around the world. So uh, if you have ideas or people you would like to refer to us, one of our big aspirations is to become a platform that helps people connect connect to and solve some of the greatest challenges of our time. So thank you for your time, and uh, I look forward to uh, learning from you during the discussion. Thanks very much. I do not have a presentation. I'm from Peace Corps and we're always afraid of losing our power sources. So I'm going to just do an old-fashioned speech. I also want to thank you for being here. I want to say we're going to take all your names and give you extra credit for being here and not at the Springsteen concert. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I had an opportunity to meet with uh, Dean Winterstein and Dean Ackers beforehand. I'm so impressed with the programs you have. I've met several of your students from the Global Resource Systems program, especially Deepak, and hearing about his work in Tanzania and meeting some of the other students. It's really very inspiring. Um, I'm delighted, Raj, that you invited me to join you here on the stage. We are very excited about partnering with USAID and the Feed the Future initiative, and especially on this day when their incredible report has been rolled out. And I really urge all of you to take a copy of it. It's out there. It shows some incredibly impressive results over the last year. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge and celebrate the 25 currently serving Peace Corps volunteers from Iowa State. We have another 15 in the pipeline. Iowa State's a great university for us. You have all the majors we like, and we're very, very grateful for you. And we encourage more and more to come. Um, you are joined by another 900 currently, or, I'm sorry, Iowa State University graduates who have served in Peace Corps since 1961. So you are among a good and distinguished group of return volunteers. There are currently 100 volunteers from Iowa serving in the Peace Corps, and they join 2,200 Iowans who have served since 1961. So Iowa is a very, very important state for us. Um, USAID and Peace Corps have been working together on Feed the Future. We are natural partners in, collab in the collaborative effort to address food security in a mutually collaborative way to address food security and, and nutrition in a long-term and self-sustaining way. Together, we are working globally to accelerate agricultural productivity, improve nutrition in communities around the world, especially among women and children. 
Although Peace Corps volunteers have worked in agriculture, the environment, and nutrition and health since the very beginning, participating in Feed the Future has sparked a resurgence of energy and focus and innovation and research. Um, that really is unparalleled in our history. Just this year we reopened the Peace Corps program in Nepal. We're very excited about that and I'm happy to say it's going to be host to one of our largest Feed the Future events. So we're very excited about that. In May, Administrator Shaw joined us at our headquarters in Washington to recognize Feed the Future as one of our most important partnerships in the world. In this five-year agreement, we have committed to providing 1,000 Feed the Future Peace Corps volunteers meaning that approximately 15% of our volunteers will work on Feed the Future activities. And many more of them will actually participate in other kinds of agriculture, gardening, health and nutrition programs. I would venture to guess that probably nearly all of our 8,000 volunteers will one way or another be engaged in food security activities. So this is a very, very important program initiative for us. Um, Feed the Future will mean that the funding from Feed the Future is going to provide excellent evidence-based packages, training packages for our volunteers and staff that will enable us to build on the tremendous momentum of USAID and our other partners. Today I'm very happy to announce that we are expanding Feed the Future activities into three more countries in 2013. Next year, um, Uganda and Ethiopia and East Africa and Guatemala in um, Latin America will become new Feed the Future Peace Corps programs. And we hope that there'll be many more. We really think that there will be um, within the coming year. Our Feed the Future partnership will maximize the impact of USAID work on the ground because we're able to ensure that the priority food security initiatives are owned by the community, that, are well, that they're well implemented, and that they are monitored and evaluated and sustained in the rural communities where Peace Corps volunteers work. Peace Corps volunteers really serve as the feet on the ground to USAID's food security initiatives. They can mobilize communities, they improve their planning, implementation, and evaluation. We work closely with USAID and other partners to ensure a coordinated approach to the implementation and sustainability of food security initiatives at the last kilometer, which is where we work in the villages around the world. Since the very beginning of Feed the Future, Peace Corps has been involved at both the global and the country level in food security coordination meetings to plan the new initiative and to bring that ground truth. USAID has funded several technical experts, one of them is here with us here in uh, Iowa State, to help Peace Corps build our training and program support for volunteers in country in order to strengthen our, um, the technical training and support that our volunteers receive. And we also have developed common indicators and monitoring and evaluation approaches to measure joint progress towards the achievement of food security results. I want to give you a few examples of how Peace Corps volunteer work supports Feed the Future. In many parts of Africa, farmers have been using the same growth and harvest techniques for generations, although new approaches and innovations could easily improve their yields and save farmers valuable time. To address this issue in Zambia, Peace Corps Feed the Future volunteers work with local farmers to identify barriers to food security and brainstorm potential innovations to meet their need through innovation workshops. More than 50 volunteers and their local counterparts have participated in these trainings and more are planned for the future. In one of these trainings, farmers identified the need for a low-cost approach to shucking and shelling corn by hand. Volunteers and local farmers work together to design and introduce locally produced maize shellers. These maize shellers not only dramatically decreased the amount of time that was spent shelling corn by hand, but also increased the volume of corn that could be sold because corn could be shucked and shelled at the marketplace, thus reducing spoilage. As another example, in Mali, Peace Corps volunteers conducted participatory surveys to identify community food security needs. The surveys conducted in the town of Niono revealed that despite, a large, uh, despite the town's location in the rice growing area in the Niger River Delta, a large percentage of small farmers in the area were food insecure for two to six months a year. In addition, the number of times a week that a family's ate meat dropped to almost zero during that difficult time, indicating a likely lack of protein in people's diets. 
Second time volunteer Chris Harmer reflected on how to get more protein into these families' diets without adding an additional burden of either time or money. He applied for and received Feed the Future funding from USAID Mali to train farmers in the practice of adding fish to traditional rice production systems. The farmers were really enthusiastic about the advantages of this production system, particularly its low cost of startup, which was compared to the cement-based uh, fish farms that other farmers were developing, which cost upwards of $6,000 each. What was most appealing about this technology is that it was lo very low-tech, easily disseminated, almost no risk to the farmers, and could be easily scaled up. Also, raising fish in rice paddies increased rice production by an average of 10% thanks to the natural fertilizing components of the fish. In Senegal, Peace Corps volunteers train master farmers who use their own parcels of land to help convey to other farmers the importance of mulching and peanut shells as a way to improve soil fertility. As a result, participating farmers are seeing crop yields that are double those of their neighbors. Peace Corps is using all of the social media tools and other, uh, you know, the internet and what have you, uh, available to the Millennium Generation. I, we just had a, uh, we have a new set of slides from the field, and it was interesting because virtually every slide had a laptop in it. No matter where the volunteer was, if they were in the field, if they were in a health clinic, there was always a laptop. So different from when I was a volunteer 30 years ago. A Peace Corps food security group has recently been created on Facebook. This group aims to facilitate collaboration and knowledge sharing on food security related issues and activities among Peace Corps volunteers and staff, return Peace Corps volunteers, universities, USAID, and other development partners. More specifically, it serves as a forum for sharing information, asking and answering questions, accessing resources, and building a global Peace Corps community of learning on food security. I was also really happy to meet Ken Choquette, who's the father of Patrick Choquette, Iowa. He's from Iowa, he's from here. And he is in charge of our, um, our project involving uh, NASA and random hacks of kindness. So we also are doing this hacking thing, which is um, identifying innovation solutions for um, food security and other Peace Corps related development issues. So Peace Corps is really um, trying very hard to get into the 21st century with the technology that's available in communities and local communities. I gotta tell you, it's changed so much. I can get a better cell phone signal in rural Liberia than I can get in Washington. DC. So the world is changing. I'd like to share a little bit about what Peace Corps Feed the Future volunteers will be doing in our three newest countries. In Guatemala, our um, Feed the Future volunteers will focus on nutrition and community agricultural development and on a healthy schools program where kids will learn healthy nutritional practices and gardening skills. In Uganda, we'll launch programs to enhance community skills in nutrition, marketing, and agricultural production. And in Ethiopia, volunteers will focus on community-based natural resource management and enhanced training in permaculture. It gives me really immense pleasure to announce the Feed the Future countries here at Iowa State University, which as uh, Raj already mentioned, is really recognized worldwide as being one of our, our world's premier agricultural universities. Without a doubt, many of you in the room today will go on to lead successful careers in agriculture and in development in general. And I really hope that you will take a look at Peace Corps as a pop possible way to launch your new career. In a world in which a child dies from hunger every six seconds, and our demand for food is higher than any other time in human history, I know that Feed the Future volunteers will continue to make a difference during the years ahead. Many of you already have chosen a career in agriculture, environment, or health, hoping to alleviate global poverty or malnutrition. So let me pose a question to you. How can you best use your degree and your talents to make a difference in our world? The world's problems are getting bigger, more complex, and more urgent every year. And as we've been reminded today by Dr. Shaw, food security and poverty reduction continue to be challenges and they're age old. Peace Corps volunteers serve two years in developing countries, working with local communities to confront some of the world's greatest challenges at the community level and in the process, their lives are transformed. In training and as they serve, Peace Corps volunteers develop sk uh, skills that can launch a professional career, either domestically or internationally. It doesn't matter if you're interested only in working internationally. Peace Corps service is good for domestic work as well. 
Just so happens that one of our newest hires at Peace Corps is Mary Fuller, a returned Peace Corps volunteer and a graduate of Iowa State. She grew up in Corning, Iowa, attended Iowa State, and majored in agricultural education and life studies. After she graduated, she served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Zambia. Regarding her experience, Mary says, living and working in Zambia opened my eyes to a whole new kind of agriculture. My father is a farmer, but farming in Zambia is completely different. It was humbling to work with people whose very lives depended on their crops. They were directly responsible for feeding themselves, their families, their neighbors. Even increasing yields by a small amount made a huge difference, it meant that they could send their kids to school, it meant that they had more food for the lean times, and meant that they had respect in their communities. By working overseas, volunteers learn not only language and cross-cultural skills, but also important technical skills. These are all important for careers in international development in places such as USAID. In fact, at this very moment, there are thousands of return volunteers who work at USAID, including my husband, <laughs> who is a return volunteer himself. I want to end with a story that I think really in, uh, illustrates the impact that Peace Corps has on our countries and our, on our volunteers and points to the unique niche that Peace Corps has in the development arena. About nine months ago, I had the opportunity to meet with President Alpha Conde, who is the president of Guinea. He was invited to the United States by President Obama, who had invited four recently democratically elected presidents to come as part of a celebration of democracy in West Africa. And it's not unusual for the leaders of uh, Peace Corps countries when they come to the United States to request audience with Peace Corps leadership. And so I went to visit him at the Willard Hotel right next to the White House about an hour before his visit with pre uh, President Obama. It was a very formal meeting as meetings often are with heads of state and we started by exchanging thanks and um, thanking each other for supporting. I thanked him for supporting uh, our volunteers. He thanked me for the service that we had provided to his country. We exchanged some tokens of appreciation and I was keeping my eye on my watch because I was aware that in a few minutes he had to go to the White House right across the street to meet with President Obama. And in my mind I was thinking he probably wants to get this meeting over with pretty quickly. So I was hurrying the meeting along thinking that that's what he wanted. But as I rose to go, he put his hand on my arm and he said, please, now that we're done with the formalities, I'd like to speak to you from my heart. So I thought, oh, this is different. So I sat down and this is what he said. He said, I want to tell you how Peace Corps has transformed not only my lives, but the lives of my people. When I was a volunteer, many years ago, I mean sorry, when I was a, a young boy many years ago there was a Peace Corps volunteer who lived next door to me in a hut in my small village in the center part of uh, Guinea. He was an agroforestry volunteer. In the day he worked with farmers and in the evenings he helped me study for my national exam. We worked on, to the light of his kerosene lantern every evening. He's the first person that I can remember who believed in me and believed that I had a life outside the boundaries of my village. And because of his help, I was able to pass my, pass my national exam. And, because of, and then he went on to help me to find the right university to navigate the difficult path of financial aid forms and health insurance and everything you need to do to go to, a United, to a go to a school in the United States. And uh, I am certain, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I would not be president today if it was not because of this man. His name is Joe, and he's a lifelong friend of mine today. But even more important than Joe's impact in my life is the impact of your Peace Corps volunteers on the lives of my people. By your presence, you tell my people that Americans care about them. You care so much about my people that you're willing to give us your greatest asset, your sons, your daughters, your mothers, your fathers, who leave everything that is near and dear to them and come to live among my people. You come and you learn my language. You eat our food. You work on our priorities. You ride our broken down buses. You are with us. By being with us, your being there validates us in a way that no amount of money can, even more than many of the development projects that have been funded in my country. Your being there shows us that your country cares about us and that we are important. 
We are proud to call you family. We are proud to teach you our language. We're proud to cook our food for you. We call you family. You give us a hand up and not a handout. I hear the story in nearly every country I visit. Actually, I hear it in every country I visit. It's not always from a president, but it often is, especially in Africa. It's not at all uncommon for presidents and ministers and uh, corporate leaders to have been taught by a Peace Corps volunteer. But sometimes it's from a taxi driver or a nurse or a farmer or a mother. Sometimes it's been four decades since that person has seen their Peace Corps volunteer. But that's what we do. We work at the last kilometer, or in this case, perhaps the last hectare. We build relationships, relationships that enable behavior change, permanent behavior change, to happen. We are the last link in the U.S. development assistance chain. We're proud to work with USAID and Feed the Future. And although we are not a huge agency, we are very powerful. And by changing lives one village at a time, we are feeding the future. Thank you. Can you turn this on? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Great, great. That was a touching story. Thank you. You know, I uh, hear it all the time, literally. Yeah, it seems to me that to feed the future, you need to feed the person that is at the present in front of you, and one at a time. Right. It's like the starfish story. Does anyone know the starfish story? Tell For those us. of you who don't know, the starfish story goes like this. It's very short. There's a, a big storm, and the storm brings all the starfish out of the ocean, and they're scattered all over the beach. And they're going to die, because they're baking in the hot sun. So a little boy comes along, and he starts tossing starfish back into the ocean. Of course, there are hundreds of thousands of starfish, and an adult comes by and says, what are you doing? You can't hope to make a difference. There are hundreds of thousands of starfish here. And he, set, he uh, scooped up a starfish and throws it into the water and said, makes a difference to this one. And that's, that's what Peace Corps does. <laughs> And I also want to say that, um, frankly, you know, I hear stories from host country nationals, the people that we work with in our, in our countries of service. But I also every day meet Peace Corps volunteers, and I know that there are a number. Actually, I could, could I ask for a show of hands? Are there returned Peace Corps volunteers here? Great. Wow. And I know, because I talk to you folks all the time, too, how most of you feel that you got more than you gave. Am I right? So it's a transformative experience for Peace Corps volunteers. It sure well. is. And thank you very much, Dr. Shah. You are feeding the future by seeding the future, by watering the future, by empowering the future. So thank you very, very much. Um, they are getting some questions uh, collected now, but I have two questions that the students already gave me. And this uh, question is uh, for you, Dr. Shah. Uh, there has been a strong push by policymakers and professionals to increase the food production in developing countries. What are you doing in the Feed the Future programs on the issue of food distribution and access? Do you address these issues and how? Yeah, well, that, that's a great question because we've all seen that increases in agricultural production don't always lead to large reductions in child malnutrition and. Uh, improved welfare for families that are most vulnerable. Uh, that's why when we designed Feed the Future, we said, look, we're going to take a very comprehensive approach. We need to look at food systems, we need to look at access, and uh, that's why in our measurement system we track both the number of farm households we reach with uh, agricultural interventions, but also the number of at-risk children we reach with targeted malnutrition interventions, specifically for those kids in the in the thousand days of pregnant being uh, pregnancy and the first two years of life. And in that period, we know if you reach children with 
nutrition interventions in that moment, it will have uh, tremendous long-term benefits. So, so we really do work on both of those issues. And uh, the other piece of access, I think this is important because Iowa State has so many uh, scientists and people who really understand food systems, is if you think about it over the course of the next 10, 20 years, you'll have about 2 billion, maybe even more people go through this transition from one to two dollars a day of income to ten dollars a day of income. And as you know, when people make that transition, the first thing they do is diversify their food intake. And I think now is our moment to make sure that as people, as societies gain income and people move out of extreme poverty, that they themselves demand appropriate nutrition, diversified diet, protein, <clears throat> Uh, and, and micronutrients. And the science on micronutrient deficiency has advanced so dramatically that this really has to be a central part of Feed the Future going forward. Yeah. This question is for both of you. And it says that uh, how do both of you, USAID and Peace Corps, involve the local stakeholders as well as the governments? You want to go first? Well, let, sure. let Carrie go because Peace Corps does an incredibly good job of this. We train all of our volunteers uh, to conduct community participatory assessments. Uh, in terms of food security, that's what they do right away. It's part of a food security training package, actually, that was developed under Feed the Future. But this participatory community as assessment is actually something that has been done in Peace Corps for generations. But focusing on that, we go into communities right after volunteers um, uh, complete their training and are just being introduced into their host communities. And they do this participatory planning and mapping. And they really map out food, food security and food insecurity. They talk about the seasons and develop a plan with the communities. And then they identify the places where Peace Corps volunteer work could be um, congruent with their, the village's plan. And where it's not congruent, when it requires more inputs, then they, we would reach out to Feed the Future or we reach out to the Ministry of Agriculture. But Peace Corps volunteers work at the community level and uh, hand in hand with, uh, with communities. I mean, every bit of our work is with communities. We work on their priorities. But the beginning of it is the community participatory assessment. Yeah, I think that's an important and instructive example. The other way to think about it is how do you get scale in reaching vulnerable populations and, and in particular rural communities. And in some places, like in Ethiopia, you know, they have a very large public extension system with 60,000 extension agents. Yeah. Uh, and, and recent data indicate they're performing much, much, much better than just a few years ago. <clears throat> in other settings, I think learning from the American example, the answer of how you reach people in communities will be SMS-based, exactly. you know, mobile connectivity tied to uh, agricultural extension hubs that have expertise that are more wired into uh, scientific uh, knowledge and market price information and things like that. So I think we have to keep in a very open mind and look for a broad range of solutions from the Peace Corps volunteer to the SMS text service that, you know, that can tie in communities and ensure we reach real scale. And frankly, I would just add that Peace Corps volunteers are very adept at using SMS right. text. And in, in fact, there are many of our programs I hope that. So. Yeah, they absolutely are. <laughs> and they're very adept at, at doing those kinds yeah. of interventions yeah. in all sectors, not just uh, agriculture, but also in health. Okay. This is a related question, and it says How do you empower women, not just the local constituents, but specifically women? So I'll say both in our Feed the Future effort, but really also across the board. Uh, we're now using assessment tools like a, what we call a Women's Empowerment Index that tracks. Uh, income for women versus income for men. We all know that uh, more income for women is likely to go to be invested in health and education for children versus men. Uh, so measurement is, I think, where it starts. And then the other part of it is really across everything we do, targeting women uh, in a manner that is appropriate is often most highly correlated with getting the strongest outcomes. And that's true whether you're trying to get communities to uh, adopt safe sanitation practices or uh, increase the prevalence of hand washing or get uh, girls in school or you know, tackle hunger through agricultural development. So. The next question is, you have so much talked about how to help people. What about the planet? What are you thinking of doing so that we have sustainable environmental 
issues also addressed while we are helping people. Well, well, let me just say something about that because this is another Iowa State challenge that you all should be tackling in some way. We all know that uh, you just have to look at the bell curves on uh, temperatures to know that you have a, a we're in a cycle of, of hotter and drier climate conditions for most of the communities we're talking about. We're also in a cycle where we have greater and more severe erratic weather events. Both, both of those, those things really have a disproportionate burden on the extreme poor, on people who survive on a dollar a day or two dollars a day. Uh, both because food production is such a high percentage of their income and assets, and because if every three or four years you wipe out your capital base because of a climate event, you can't accumulate resources and, and be on that path out of poverty. So, so I think there's a lot more work that can be done in this space. I'm very optimistic about water efficient uh, seed varieties across the board. I'm also very optimistic in the, this year's World Food Prize is going to Dr. Hillel for developing micro-irrigation systems that are propagated around the world. I think there's a new way to think about that. We're, we're uh, pioneering the implementation of deep nitrogen placement fertilizer, deep urea placement in Bangladesh where Bangladesh's most poor state is for the first time ever, three million people, food secure because of this, this major technological innovation in how they use fertilizer where they use less nitrogen but much, much, much more efficiently. And I think those are the kinds of things that are going to have to be part of the solution. This question talks about how are you helping the farmers? You've talked about various groups. Could you tell us a little bit specific how, what you are doing to help farmers, both of you? Why don't you take that? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, I just made a visit a couple of months ago, or actually it was nearly a year ago, to Mali. And um, I went to an area that's near Bandiagara. It's on the way up towards Mopti. It's, sort of in central Mali, and it's very, very dry. The, the, gra the ground is as hard as a rock. And there I was visiting a volunteer who was actually a business volunteer. He had a degree in economics, and he was doing community economic development. And as part of his participatory community assessment, he identified that this community had two problems. That first of all, they were only able, because of the, the soil conditions and their lack of any other sort of resources, were able to, to, to grow one crop, and that was spring onions. And they could get two um, crops out of it a year if they were lucky. And then the second problem that they had is that they had a time of about 10 months of no water at all. And then the rains would come, and the rains would sometimes come so hard that they would wash away the entire crop. And so he identified this as a problem. He actually um, identified that there was a source of funding from GTZ that was giving small grants programs for water systems. And so he wrote a grant working with the local farmers to get a dike built, a simple dike that would enable them to have a water catchment system that would enable them then to develop an irrigation system for local, um, for the gardens that surrounded this dike. It also became a way to contain the water during the rainy season and there was no longer flash flood. And so what, by the time I visited, there was this incredible, just gardens as far as the eye could see, in a landscape that is beige as can be. I mean, there is not one thing that isn't beige, except for this gorgeous, huge garden of lettuce and tomatoes and carrots and um, cucumbers. And they were able to sell this in Bandiagara, which is actually a tourist area, and there are, are um, uh, hotels and restaurants and uh, they were also of course using it to supplement their own diet and because of the demand of the um, of the hotels and restaurants the hotels and restaurants asked the municipality to pave the road to this village which then enabled them first of all to have more um, accessible around the year uh, access to their to their um, buyers and any kind of seeds that needed to come in, but also enabled them to get their girls and boys to school, enabled their mothers and children to get to the health center, enabled them to um, improve their trading practices. And this was based on a community participatory assessment, a, a guy who was recently out of college with an economics degree, and really the work with the farmers, and, and it transformed that community. Well, you know, I'd just add that you gotta think of taking that story and replicating it 1.8 million times yeah. because you know that's 
uh, what we now know in 2011, we reach 1.8 million farm households with those types of interventions. Yeah. Sometimes it's seeds, sometimes it's market access. I think that's instructive because I, you know, when we started the effort, people said, oh, okay, well, you can, you can do small projects, but can you really have impact at scale? And the reality is in 19 countries, you see these countries making tough policy reforms, attracting real private investment, domestic and international, uh, doing what Carrie said, you know, building out road networks to rural communities. And you see the story that Carrie just described replicated 1.8 million times. And the impact of that accumulated year after year after year is going to be far less poverty and extreme hunger uh, around the world in these countries. And, you know, that's part of the concept of Feed the Future, that we don't just want to do good projects, we want to solve hunger at scale in places where we have partners that are willing to make tough actions to be serious partners in doing that. Thank you, thank you. They don't hold planes because of false alarm. <laughs> so I know Dr. Shah has to leave uh, and catch a flight. So on behalf of Iowa State University, we thank you. Thank you very much. You. you are a visionary. You are a leader. You have youthful, boundless energy. <laughs> <laughs> and you have ideas that are of high impact and high value. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and you, director, you, you bring this one person being one person at a time approach, which I think is the key to success, and then scaling up, as Dr. Shah said, is the key to success of making this a good impact. Thank, Thank you so much. Join again with me in.